Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. So in this video, I'll analyze Stoneco, which is a fintech company operating in Brazil. They primarily provide payment processing solutions to small and mid-sized businesses in Brazil, somewhat similar to Square in the US. Now they did IPO in 2018 and legendary investor Warren Buffett bought about 14 million shares at the IPO price of $23 per share. Unfortunately, the stock lost a significant portion of its market value in the last few months, from $95 per share to about $15 as of today. So that's about 80% decline in less than a year. Now in this video, I'd like to do a detailed analysis and see if there is an investment opportunity for us here. At the end of the video, I'll share some potential risk that might cause the stock price to go down even more, even from this very low level. Okay, now Stoneco is currently trading at $15 per share, year-to-date down 82%. The current market cap of the company is around $4.6 billion. Compare that with the market cap of similar US businesses. So for example, PayPal is currently trading at $211 billion. And Square is trading at $90 billion. Now keep in mind, Brazil is not as developed as the US in the fintech sector. So I think there are much more opportunities to grow in Brazil in the future. Now, if you compare the population in Brazil and in US, you see that they're pretty comparable. However, in terms of GDP, there is a substantial gap. Uh, so US has about $20 trillion GDP, whereas Brazil has only around $2 trillion. So I think there are growth potentials for businesses in Brazil. Now, although it's a small economy compared to the US, you see that Brazil is still the ninth largest economy in the world. So I think being in, in an emerging market and in an area like fintech, the growth potentials for Stoneco uh, is significant. Okay, so let's now check the fundamentals of their business. So starting with the revenue, we see that in 2017, they generated 136 million US dollars in sales, but that grew to about $705 million in, in the trailing 12 months. So that's an amazing 50% year over year growth in sales. If you look at their EBITDA, you see a similar trend until 2020. So they were growing strongly uh, up until 2020, but then in last quarter, uh, the EBITDA dropped sharply. So basically they dropped from $308 million of EBITDA in 2020 to about $150 million of EBITDA in the trailing 12 months. Now there are three main reasons for this huge decline in their EBITDA. And the first one is uh, the mark-to-market loss in their bank winter investment. So basically they bought shares in a Brazilian bank and the share price went down. So they had to book an unrealized loss of approximately 240 million US dollars in the last quarter. So that's not an actual loss, rather an unrealized loss in their book. And the second reason is a significant increase in their cost of services and operations, which is not a great sign. And investors probably didn't like that. And finally, because of high interest rates in Brazil, their funding costs increased substantially and that caused a decline in their EBITDA. So basically, these are the three main reasons that I could find out uh, for the decline of EBITDA in the last quarter. Now, looking at their cash flow from operations, I really like the trend. So in 2017, they lost about $229 million from their operations. Whereas in the last 12 months, they generated 581 million US dollars in cash flow from operations. So that's tremendous. However, don't be fooled by their reporting practices. As you see here, they're delaying almost uh, 600 million US dollars um, to their clients in the last quarter. And that's probably contributing to their high cash flow from operations in the last quarter. But in any case, if they can continue generating positive cash flows in the coming quarters, I think they would be in a very strong position. Okay, let's now check their revenue segmentation. So we see that they have 38% of their revenues coming from the transaction and other services, then 34% from the financial income, 23% from subscription and equipment rental, and the rest 5% from other financial income. Now, if you look at their different revenue segments, for example, starting with the transaction and services segment. So this segment primarily depends on the number of merchants using their network and also the total payment volume processed through their network. And both these numbers, that is the active clients and the total payment volumes are actually increasing consistently year over year, as you can see here. 
which is pretty good. Now, they reduced their take rate from 1.81% to 1.67% in the last quarter. Now, this is something I don't like, but this might be a strategy to gain more market shares in the future. So we have to wait and see for that. Now, let's check the next big revenue source, which is the financial inc income, bringing about 34% of their total revenues. Now, this segment includes their credit business and their prepayment business. Now, they messed up pretty big on this particular segment. As you can see here, 48% uh, of their loans are non-performing, meaning that the borrowers are not paying back interest or principals or both in some cases for these 48% loans. Now, this ratio, 48% non-performing loan is pretty big and investors didn't like this. However, they acknowledged the mistake and they said that they are working to fix this problem so that it doesn't happen in the future. Okay, now let's take a look at the last, uh, actually the third biggest source of revenue, which is subscription and equipment rental. Now, they recently acquired the software solutions company Lynx for 1.2 billion US dollars. And that's expected to boost this particular uh, segment of their revenues. Now, that's pretty much the revenue segmentations for Stone Cold. Okay, so looking at the gross margin, we see that they had a pretty strong gross margin of about 80% until you know 2019. And then it started dropping. In 2020, they had a 75% gross margin. And in the trailing 12 months, that dropped to about 66%. Still a pretty high gross margin, but it's dropping in the last two, three years. Now, if you compare their gross margin with uh, two other fintech companies, one is Pexaguro, which operates in Brazil, the other one is Square in the US, you see that Stoneco has an impressive gross margin of 66%, compare that with Pexaguro's 22% and Square's about 25% gross margin. So they have a pretty high gross margin compared with Pexaguro and Square in the fintech industry. Now, looking at the balance sheet, we see that they have about $1 billion, $1 billion US dollars of cash and cash equivalents in their balance sheet. And their total current assets are sitting at $4.9 billion. Now, if you look at their current liabilities, the total current liabilities are sitting at about $3.5 billion. So they have enough current assets to cover all their current liabilities. So they should not have any issue in the short term. Now, looking at the long-term liabilities, uh, that's about $1 billion. So if you add that up with their short-term liabilities, you get the total liabilities of Stone Co of about $4.5 billion. Now, they have enough current assets to cover all their liabilities. So that's pretty impressive balance sheet and very strong financial position. I don't think they need to issue additional shares or issue any, any sort of uh, debt in the short-term uh, or in the near future. Okay, so looking at the valuation, we see that Stoneco is currently trading at about 6.7 times price to sales ratio. Now that's actually historically the lowest price to sales ratio for Stoneco. In terms of for price to earnings ratio, it's expected to be 11.5. Now for a high growth company like Stoneco, I think 11.5 price to earnings ratio is actually low. Comparing Stoneco with Pexaguro and Square, we see that in terms of enterprise value to sales, Stoneco is currently trading at 5.8 times, and then Pexaguro is trading at about 4.5 times, and Square is trading at about 5.7 times uh, enterprise value to sales ratio. In terms of enterprise value to EBITDA, Stoneco is currently trading at about 26 times of EBITDA, and then Pexagoro at 15 times, and Square is trading at about 124 times of their EBITDA. In terms of price to sales ratio, Stoneco is trading at 6.45 times, Pexagoro is at 4.78 times, and Square is at 5.74 times. So based on this information, I think Stoneco is currently trading at a fair valuation. I wouldn't say it's trading at a highly discounted price, but Based on this information, I think it's trading at a fair valuation. Now, look at the analyst recommendation. We see that eight analysts rated this as, um, so one analyst rated as a strong buy, two rated as a buy, four rated as hold, and one rated as underperform. Based on the analyst price target from 16 analysts, we see that 
uh, the current uh, price is at $15, but the average analyst price target is $52, which means that there is more than 200% upside uh, from, from the current share price, which is pretty good to see. Okay, so let's now talk about the risk. At the start of the video, I mentioned that there are some risks that can drive the stock price even lower from its current level. So that's what I'm going to explain in a moment. So if you look at the inflation rates in Brazil uh, in 2021, you will notice that it's rising drastically from the start of the year and currently sitting at around 11%. Now, to fight inflation, most central banks raise interest rates. As you see here, Central Bank of Brazil took a similar action and raised interest rates significantly starting from about March, April of 2021. And currently, their interest rate is sitting at around 8%. So every time you have a high interest rate from the central bank, people tend to take out their money from the stock market and invest in a more secured government treasury or bonds which is yielding about 8%, for example, in this case. And that's exactly what's happening in Brazil. If you look at the stock market index, it's dropping sharply with the rising interest rates. From its peak in June, it lost about 23% uh, value in the last few months. So the problem is, although the interest rate is currently sitting at about 8%, we don't really know how far the inflation will rise and how much more the interest rates will go up. If you look at the interest rate history in Brazil, uh, they even had a 14% interest rates in 2016. So that's not good. And consequently, their stock market was at the bottom in 2016 over that same period of time. So the point I'm trying to make here is that um, the Central Bank of Brazil might need to rise their interest rates again in the near future to fight inflation. And if that's the case, I wouldn't be surprised to see their stock market crashing even more. And with the overall market going down, Stone Coast share price can go down even more, even from this very low level. So I think that's a pretty uh, important risk that you should consider. So just be careful of this uh, risk going forward. That's my opinion. Okay, let's summarize the video. I think they have a very strong balance sheet. I don't see the risk of bankruptcy or issuing additional shares in the near future. Uh, they have a very high gross margin of 67%, much better than their peers Square or let's say Pexaguro. Um, they're growing in all segments. That's another positive point for them. The valuation is fair. I think at this point, it's a fair valuation and it's a good time to start building a small position. Um, that's just my opinion. Uh, they have a very high non-performing loans ratio, and that's not good. Uh, and lastly, the most important risk I consider is the risk of interest rate hikes in Brazil, because that will drag down the stock market. And with the overall stock market, the Stone Coast share price can go down even more, even from this very low level. So personally for me, I have about 2% of my portfolio in this stock. Uh, I entered very recently, so my cost basis is about $18 per share. I'm not adding at this point. I'll probably add if it goes down even more uh, in the short term. Uh, but other than that, I'm not adding at this point. So I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, uh, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Um, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Good luck with the investment.